Now, we need to understand the Pharisees are a small but a very influential special interest group of the first century religious and political life within Judaism. And they are either collectively or individually mentioned 98 times in the New Testament. Most of those being in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the Pharisees are, they're the ones that took it upon themselves to say who was in and who was out, right? When it came to the kingdom of God, that is, they considered themselves the self-appointed guardians of all things concerning God. And they created this us versus them mentality, calling those who disagreed with them outsiders, while they relished their elite insider with God status. Over time, they created <clears throat> some carefully crafted categories. And one of those that they created was sinners. Sinners. And that included, but not limited to, the lepers, the paralytics, the tax collectors, and the prostitutes. And the outsider status that they conferred upon these legitimized in their twisted way of thinking that they shouldn't receive compassion, mercy, and forgiveness. But yet they are the ones who needed it most. Now Jesus, because of this, was at odds with the Pharisees early and often. And notice the particular phrase that Luke uses to describe what the Pharisees were doing around Jesus. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, what? Muttered. Don't you love that word, muttered? The word muttered is a fascinating word that linguistics call, let me see it, David, uh, what? Somebody pronounce that for me. <laughs> okay, if you're an English teacher, you probably could pronounce that. But I'll just say watermelon. Well, but what it means is it phonetically imitates the word that it describes. You know, we can think of other words that do that. Oink. That's what a pig says. Hey, yeah, that sounds like that. How about meow? Or roar? Or chirp? They sound like the words they're describing, do they not? And likewise, the word muttered is sometimes translated murmured, sounds like what they were doing. You know, I, I think of one of those little spin toys that my kids had when they were little. And you take that big arrow and you'd point it at one of the animals. And then you pull the string or pull the lever. And what's it do? You point it at the pig, it says, the pig says, oink. The cat goes, meow. The lion goes, roar. And the Pharisees go, mutter, murmur, mutter, murmur, mutter, murmur. It sounds like what they're doing. And why were the Pharisees muttering and murmuring? 15.2, Gospel of Luke, very simple. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, we do understand this morning that was not meant as a compliment, right? They didn't like the company that Jesus kept because his known associates were not known as very reputable people at all. These are not the people that any respectable rabbi of Jesus' day, let alone the one that's claiming to be Messiah. The rabbi should be associated with those people. So the question the Pharisees ask is why does Jesus party with the wrong people? Have you ever been offended by somebody else's party? I bet you haven't. You didn't even think about it. September 11th, 2001. I was probably never offended as I was that day by somebody having a party. We know what happened on that day, right? We remember that day. 3,000 citizens of the United States lost their lives to the terrorists that attacked the buildings. But what happened after that is what set me off. We saw in those countries that hate the United States, we saw them having a party. They were out in the streets shooting off guns. They were shooting off firecrackers. They were having parades all because they hated the United States. That ticked me off. I don't think those parties should have ever happened. 
at the expense of the lost lives that we had. Now, let me take it down and not be so dramatic with it, but it also reminds me of football. When a linebacker blitzes and he tackles a quarterback and he starts his jumping up and down, he, he gets paid to do that, right? And yet he gets all pumped up, excited, pumping his hand, and the quarterback's hurt. I don't think there's a place for that. When those things happen, those are parties that shouldn't happen. And yet, so many times they do. But that's how the Pharisees felt when Jesus was eating with the known and notorious sinners. In their way of thinking, these parties should never happen. But you see, the Pharisees were just being consistent with their portrait of God. You see, the way that they understood God was that God had an invitation list to his party. And anyone claiming association with God, and that should be a very, very small list. And as a matter of fact, the Pharisees thought that they should be in charge of the invitations. But in this text, Jesus paints a very different portrait of God. In Luke 15, he uses three stories, one right after the other, in response to their charges, and more importantly, to their portrait of God. First story, Luke chapter 15. Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Hey, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. And I tell you that in the very same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. This story that Jesus just told is for the men that are sitting in his audience. You see, it's, it's hard for us to appreciate this story because we read it with Western eyes. We don't read it with the culture in mind where it took place. You see, in those days, they didn't keep the sheep for meat. They kept the sheep for wool. So that meant that they had these sheep for a long time. Kenneth Bailey, he writes this. The average Jewish landover might have between 5 and 15 sheep. So to have a flock of 100 sheep meant it was most likely the collective flocks of an entire village. A team of shepherds would rotate shifts and watch the flock. He says this is what was happening the night Jesus was born. And if you're, if you're watching somebody else's sheep, losing even one of them would be considered the ultimate dereliction of duty. Especially in the eyes of those who own those sheep. And as Jesus tells this story, I can just picture a couple guys sitting in the back. Benjamin, Joseph, right? They're just nodding their heads. Because they remember the night that their friend Ephraim, he lost the ram. The ram. Right? It was the one who was going to breed the rest of the sheep, and that way they'd have a bunch of lambs in the spring. So Ephraim, he searched all night. He looked for that lamb everywhere he could, that ram. And he finally found it. He carried it home. And when he did and he got back, he threw a big old party. And the entire village came out. And they all joined in the celebration. You see, Benjamin and, and, and Joseph were nodding their heads because they were at that party and they knew that it was just more than relief that he found that sheep. They rejoiced. Then Jesus goes on to tell the next story. This is for the women in his audience. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she delight, or doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now again, we can't truly appreciate this unless we know the culture. This is not just a quarter that fell out of some change purse. In that time, a woman who was married would have a necklace of 10 coins. 
It was a symbol that she was a wife. It was part of her identity. It'd be like, ladies, if you lost, you know, that carrot and a half diamond that's in your engagement ring. Oh, you're not laughing. You must have one. If you lose that, what do you do? You look everywhere to try to find it. If you lose your wedding bed, you look everywhere to try to find it. That's what it would be today. And that's why this, this lady was so intent in the story to find it is because it meant that much. And so Jesus is telling a story, and I just picture two women in the back. We're going to call them Rachel and Rebecca. And they're just nodding their heads, whispering to each other. Do you remember when Miriam lost her coin? Do you remember the argument that led between her and her husband, Jacob? Do you remember when she finally found that last coin? She invited us over to her house and we had this party. We were just so happy for her. You know, I think we have a problem with these stories and that is because we read them with our head. And let's be honest, they don't make sense from the head. If you're an accountant, you would never tell a shepherd to leave 99 sheep in an open field and go find one stray. That's a 1% loss. Next spring, he's going to have all these lambs. He's going to cover that loss with no problem. If you're an accountant, your client tells you, I lost one coin out of my 10. That's okay. I'm going to invest those other nine in such a way. We'll make that up in no time. That's how an accountant would work. That's how the head would work. But we can't read these stories with our head. We can't read them with our heart. Have you ever lost something that had a value to you that far exceeded what it really cost? Did you get it back? How'd you feel when you got it back? We were living in North Canton and I was out riding a bike one evening and uh, I'm always looking at, you know, what people drop, what's laying around. Well, I found a billfold. And I picked that billfold up. And I opened it up to find the driver's license to see who it was, to see where they lived. And I found out who it was. Didn't live too far from where I was on the bike. So I jumped on the bike and took that billfold to the house, knocked on the door. The guy was on the phone. I think he's probably on the phone with the police because, I mean, he was just shook up. And I knocked on the door and I held the billfold up in the air. And he hung up the phone real quick. And he hurried to the door. I mean, it's like he ran to the door and he's only five feet away. But he thanked me profusely for getting his billfold back to him. He offered me all the money that was in the billfold. I have no idea how much was in there. I didn't even look. Neither was I going to accept it. Why would I need a reward for picking something up on the ground and taking it three blocks to a house? You don't need that. But yet, he was so thankful. It was more than just a relief to him. He was partying. He was celebrating the return of that. You know, have you ever lost a wallet? <laughs> yeah, today with credit cards in it. You know? But you know what people lose today they get more frantic about? I lose this, I go nuts. One time it was out of my possession for five hours. I'm surprised I still have hair. I had left it in the car. Therefore, even calling it didn't matter because I was nowhere around it. And I just went frantic. That's what happens. And when I found it, boy, there was a big relief. But it was also party time. It was so important to me. There's a story that comes out of Tel Aviv. This is awesome. It came out of Tel Aviv, Israel in the late 2000s. The daughter had noticed that her mother was sleeping on a very lumpy old mattress. And so she thought that she gonna surprise her mom. So when mom was out of town, the daughter bought her a new mattress and she put it on the bed and she took the old mattress to the curb so it could be taken to the dump. 
Some of you are ahead of me. When the mother got home from her trip, she laid on her bed, and the first thing she noticed was something wrong with my mattress. She pulled the sheets back, and she found out she had a brand new mattress. And because she had a brand new mattress, she started wailing and screaming and carrying on. Now, I don't picture that being the response to having a new mattress in my bed. But that was hers. And the reason she had that is because this mama did not trust banks. And so she had been stuffing money in that mattress for years and years. She had stuffed over $1 million in that mattress. You want to guess what her daughter and she did the rest of the day? They were at every dump they could find trying to find that mattress, as we would be as well. And when they found it, to say they were relieved is an understatement. You see, Jesus is saying because you have a picture of God that doesn't value people. This is what he said to the Pharisees. Because you have a picture of God that doesn't value people. You think they're filthy, you think they're dirty, and you think they just need to be thrown out. But God says they are valuable to me because they're made in my image. And they must be found. And when they're recovered safely, there is a great party in heaven that breaks out spontaneously. Then Jesus tells one more story. And he adds one final startling brush stroke to the portrait of God that he came to reveal. Now we're going to spend the next three weeks studying this story in depth. But today I'm just going to give you a quick flyover of the content and characters. The story is about a father that had two sons. Not one, two. And I believe it's a mistake to call this the parable of the prodigal son singular. I think it's a big mistake and over the next few weeks you'll understand why I think that. But the younger son, he's a rebellious, overconfident young man who has demanded total freedom from the restrictions of his home. And so one day he goes to his dad, he says, Dad, I've noticed something. You're still breathing. That means you're not dead. And that means I'm not getting my inheritance. I'm tired of waiting for you to die, old man. Give me my inheritance and I mean now. Jesus' listeners of that day, they couldn't believe what he was saying. Their ears, man, they, they'd never seen or heard anything so disrespectful, so disgraceful, coming from a child to the father. You see, the traditional Middle Eastern father would be expected to respond to this request by driving the son out of the family, probably with some harsh words, but more than that, probably with some physical blows. But the father in this story didn't do anything like that. Because, you see, the father's response in that day and time, in the, hearers of, uh, the ears of the listeners of Jesus, his, his response was even more startling than the son's disrespect. Jesus simply said, he divided the property between them. Now, we have to understand that most people in the world, in that time, the bulk of their wealth was in their real estate, was in their property. This father was a landowner. He probably received that land from his father, and his father received it from his father, and his father from his father. Probably for generations, this land had been in that family. And so when it says that he divided the land between them, he was literally tearing his financial life apart. Many had to draw up a new deed. A deed that gave the older brother two-thirds of the estate, which was a practice of that day. And he gave one-third to the younger son. And you know what that no account, good for nothing, younger son did with his property? He sold it. He sold it because you can't buy beer and chase women with a deed. 
Jesus listeners, I'm telling you, if you're sitting there with this crowd, you are horrified. You are gasping, right? And you hear somebody say, oh, no, he didn't. Oh, yes, he did. He sold the land to get cash, and he headed to what Jesus describes as a far country. Far away from the father, far away from the old brother, far away from anybody that knew him. And many uh, theologians think that he went to a, a country called Bethshan. Bethshan is very similar to Las Vegas or New Orleans or something like that. As a matter of fact, there's a sign as you enter Bethshan that says, what happens in Bethshan stays in Bethshan. <laughs> Jesus simply said he squandered his wealth in wild living. And the people hearing this story are thinking this is the most worthless son that I've ever heard of. Good riddance to him. No father deserves a boy like that. But the father, who couldn't make the boy stay, couldn't let the boy go either. So every night he'd stand on his balcony of his house, he would look the southward down the road where he'd last seen his son disappear over the horizon. And as he looked, he longed. And one evening, right before dusk, he sees this familiar figure walking toward him. You know that everybody walks different, right? I can see you, as, as I look out here, I can't see anybody's face because the bright light behind you covers your face. It's a shadow. But most of you, I can tell who you are by the way you walk. Did you know that? We all have a different gait. We all have a different way we walk. And so it's a matter that he saw him coming and he saw the walk, probably not as perky as it was as he was leaving. He's probably slumped over a little bit in his body. Couldn't see his face. But he recognized that familiar stride and even he thought the steps were a little slower. The frame was a little more slouched. The boy was dirty. He smells. He's absolutely broke and broken but he's headed home people listening to Jesus can't stand it anymore what is his father going to do with this ungrateful disrespectful irreverent son who wants to return let's let Jesus tell it beginning in verse 20 but while he was still a long way off his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine who was dead is alive again. And he was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Listen, nobody prior to this time in this story and Jesus had ever painted a portrait of God that looked like that. And can let's be honest, let's just be honest today. We don't have the portrait of God like that. We've heard the story many, many times. And we still don't have the right picture. Jesus is saying to his listeners then, and he's saying to us, the listeners today, if we can't see God right, then we will not see people right. I want to do a little quick summary as we're closing here. Talk about themes that came out of these three stories. The first theme is this. Every story starts with a separation. Something of value is separated from someone to whom it belongs. And when Jesus is using this, he's using a word in these stories that is lost. And this is a very strong word for lost. It's the same word the disciples used when they're in this storm and Jesus is sleeping and they're scared and they go wake him up. And Lord, don't you care that we perish? Don't you care that we're going to be lost? It's the same word that Peter uses in his second letter in the New Testament, where he says, God is not willing that anyone should perish. Not willing that anyone should be lost. It's a scary, sobering word. But Jesus used it in all three stories. And later on in the same gospel, Gospel of Luke, 
There's another tax collector. In fact, he's the chief tax collector of the whole region who would have been the wealthiest and most hated of them all. He was a wee little man. You know who he is, don't you? He was a wee little man. His name was Zacchaeus. He wants to meet Jesus. And true to his messianic vision, Jesus goes to the house of Zacchaeus. He eats with him and tells him that salvation has come to his house. And true to their misaligned view, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they began to mutter. He'd gone to be the guest of a sinner. There he goes again, off parting with the sinners. And one more time, Jesus defines his mission in Luke 19, 10. He says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. It starts with separation. It starts with being lost. Then the second theme that we find in these stories is every story tells a rescue, recovery, rejoicing party to, to restore that which was lost. The sheep, after extensive search, search was recovered. The lost coin, after a good house cleaning is found. The lost son, after spending and being spent in a far country, comes back home. And Jesus adds one detail to this third story that we can't miss. It would be scandalous to the people of Jesus' day when he's talking to them. This is what Jesus said, Luke 15, 20. The father ran to his son. Now, older Jewish men of that day, they wore robes. How do you run in a robe? You can't, can you? You have to hike it up above the knees. That did not happen in this culture. It was considered vulgar and disgraceful for a man over 30 to show his knees in public. I think we need to bring that law back. <laughs> the only way that that father could run to that boy was to look as undignified as the boy did. To take the shame of the boy unto himself. And it's in that detail of the story that we see really another story. If the Father in this story represents God, the Father in heaven, and it does, then friend, this is the only time in Scripture where God is pictured as being in a hurry. He is fast to forgive, and he runs to reconcile. No Pharisee had ever pictured God that way. If they had, they would have joined the parties, but they didn't. Theme number three, every story ends with a party. Every story ends with a party. Everybody's happy except the older brother and the fattened calf. Older brother shows up. After a long day working in the father's fields, he hears the music and the dancing. He finds out it's for his younger brother who's returned. He just gets ticked. He's angry. He says, we shouldn't be having a party for this guy. He disrespects dad. He blows his inheritance on God knows what. And when he runs out of money and his low life friends desert him, then he drags his little sorry butt back home. And we're having a party for him. Are you kidding me? But to father, no party was no option. Look at what the father says in verse 32. But we had to celebrate and be glad because his brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The phrase we had to celebrate, that's another very strong phrase that Jesus uses. It's the same thing that Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, verse 31. The Son of Man must suffer many things. And he must be killed and after three days rise again. In the same word that uh, he used after his resurrection, when he saw two of his discouraged disciples, he said, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Folks, listen, there are not many things that God has to do. But he must be faithful. He can't break a promise. He must be truthful because in his character, God is truth. Can't tell a lie. Got to be joyful because he can't deny his character. 
And when one of his kids repents and returns home, God cannot not celebrate. He had to celebrate and be glad. Folks, listen, when we know people, and all of us do, who've been far from God and they start heading home, then we should be the first to run and greet them, celebrate them, because this is what Jesus says is happening in heaven. And after all, didn't Jesus teach us to pray? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You want to start a party in heaven? Repent. Repent. You know, we all know people who after the party repent or have to repent. But you want to start a party in heaven, it's different. You repent and the party starts. You don't go finding Jesus, you repent, Jesus finds you, the party finds you. That's how it operates. Turn to Jesus to initiate a great celebration. Don't go to the party to find Jesus. Go to Jesus and watch the party find you. Because no party is no option to the Father who is fast to forgive and fast to reconcile. We refer to people who come to church looking for God, as Derek stated earlier, and we've used the term seeker for folks like that. But when you read scripture through, what you find is God is always the seeker. He is seeking to redeem the lost, and that is us. Romans 3.23 tells us all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, which means we all need a Savior.